Um, just a quick hello and welcome to everybody and a thank you for joining us tonight. Um, back on Zoom, hoping that this fall we can resume some of our in-person programs. We're looking forward to seeing people in person um, at some point in 2022. Um, looks like that first opportunity will be at the charter dinner in October. Um, so keep an eye out for information on that uh, going forward. My name is Susan O'Hanley, and I am one of three co-presidents for Delaware at Sego Audubon Society. Um, you'll hear us refer to DOAS, and that's just short for Delaware at Sego Audubon Society, for those who might not know that. Um, we are expecting some more people to roll in as we begin, um, but we're not going to hold things up um, because we've got a great presentation coming, and we want to get to it as soon as we can. I am joined this evening by fellow board members um, and moderators for this evening, Becky Gretton, who is uh, one of our other co-presidents, can give a wave, Becky, <laughs> and Charlie Scheim, who is the DOAS treasurer. Um, and they'll be helping with um, just monitoring for any questions that might come through during the program this evening. Um, if you have a question, at any time uh, during the presentation, use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom controls or within the Zoom controls, usually on a, a laptop or desktop, it's at the bottom of the screen, um, Q&A, and you can ask your questions there. That just helps us track what's already been answered versus what still needs to be answered. And we will take time at the end of the program to um, answer any outstanding questions. Some of them may be answered during the course of the program. So it's very helpful to use the Q&A section for that. Um, we will be watching chat as well, but it's harder for us to keep track of because things just scroll off the screen. So before we begin, I'm just gonna go over a couple of announcements um, that are based on the slides that you may or may not have seen while you were waiting here for us to begin. Um, Tonight's presentation, Landscaping with Native Plants with Lisa Tessier. We're so excited. I can't wait to hear some of the guides and how to's um, from Lisa for tonight's program. Um, this program actually coincides a little bit with our Native Plant Sale fundraiser. So I'll give a quick plug for that here. Uh, we're winding down on our pre sales. Pre orders are accepted through April 22nd. So that's a week from tonight. Um, so between now and then, place your orders for any plants, uh, pick up your plants on May 21st over in Hartwick. Uh, they're having an EV car show um, with their community energy project, and we'll be there for the plant pickup um, at that show. So May 21st is the pickup date at the Hartwick, uh, town of Hartwick EV car, uh, car show. Uh, announcement about uh, Audubon Camp. I'm not sure if you've seen any of the publicity around this. Um, we've had some great PR. It's been in the Daily Star and some of the local papers. Um, we're resuming our camp program this summer for youth. And we're really thrilled um, to, to be able to say that uh, after two years of kind of having that program put on pause. So the dates this summer, uh, July 25th to 28th is for children entering grades three and four, and August 15th through 18th for children entering grades five and six. And all the information and all the registration is on the DOAS website. So www.doas.us. Um, next month's program will be Friday, May 20th. Um, and that is Breeding Bird Atlasing with Charlie Scheim, who is our um, member of our board of directors, our treasurer here at DOAS. He's also the regional uh, Breeding Bird Atlas III coordinator. So he's got a lot of great information to share and we're, we're thrilled to have him present for us um, next month also on Zoom. Field trips coming up. Uh, Susquehanna Greenway Bird Walk um, with Charlie Scheim and Sandy Bright on May 7th. May 14th is the DOAS Big, Bay, uh, Big Day Bird Count. So 
if you're interested in participating in that, um, there is also information on our website and your contact person is Charlie Shine. And May 18th, uh, Wildflower Walk at Gilbert Lake State Park. And that is with member and expert botanist Connie Tedesco, who's here with us tonight um, as an attendee. So um, just so glad to have those things coming forward and some in-person field trips um, this year uh, coming into spring. The EV events I did mention, um, another thing you may have seen in the papers is EcoFair, which is a new event that takes the place of what was formerly Earth Festival that took place around Earth Day. Um, EcoFair is going to be bigger. It will be at Neowa Park in Oneonta on Saturday, July 9th. Um, lots of things going on there, and they're currently, we are currently, we're working as part of the collaborative for the Susquehanna Headwaters Environmental Collaborative. Um, there's information on there about how to be a vendor or an exhibitor or a sponsor. So that's our, our greatest need at that point, and then certainly attendees on July 9th. Our optics raffle sold out. Um, we are so grateful to all of the people who helped make that happen, our fundraising committee, Dorian Haneke, Jane Backman, Pam Peters, and Catherine Devino. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. Um, it just said, and me, and I'm like, wait a minute, who's me? <laughs> so um, we'll do the announcements for the winners for that right after the presentation tonight. And now, without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Becky, who will introduce Lisa, our speaker for this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, Susan. Our speaker tonight is Lisa Tessier, who teaches in the liberal arts and sciences and the sustainability programs at SUNY Delhi. She has degrees in landscape architecture from Cornell University and from the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry. She previously taught at Capital Community College and at SUNY ESF. We are very happy to welcome Lisa tonight. Thanks, Becky, and thanks, Susan, and everyone from, for joining us tonight. And I thank uh, DOAS for this opportunity. I'm really excited to share some of my experiences and ideas of um, designing with native plants, uh, especially thinking about that in the home context. And I look forward to uh, a return to in-person um, presentations like this too, because I do miss seeing everybody. Uh, and I will make sure I try to get to some of your questions at the end um, of the presentation today. So I'm gonna just try to share my screen. Okay, can I have a thumbs up? Everybody can see this okay? All right, thank you, Charlie. <laughs> so, uh, what we'll be talking about today, um, it, you know, we'll briefly cover what a native plan is and why why does it matter. Uh, and the more I've been doing presentations like this over the years, the less I probably need to say about that first bullet. Uh, more people are aware of native plants and are start, starting to think about, you know, why we may want to use them. And that's wonderful. But we'll cover that briefly. And then we'll spend a little bit of time talking about the importance of site analysis and really thinking about what you have uh, in the place that you're trying to plant uh, and how that can help guide your design. We'll talk about design and some of the things I think about when I start to try to choose plants for a particular site. And we'll go through some of those uh, things. And then I'll share a couple of my favorites with you. It was very challenging. I tried to um, narrow it down a little bit. I don't want to uh, overwhelm you. There are many to choose from, but I'll share a couple of my favorites and explain why I really particularly like these plants. And then I will talk a little bit about implementation. So you have a design and um, how do you secure plants? Uh, what should you look for and how might you plant them? Uh, and so that's sort of where we're going uh, with the presentation tonight. And I think um, I was thinking about this on, on my walk home, and I'm going to share just a really brief story before we start to hit the uh, first slide. And that is, um, I was uh, probably, I was a junior as an undergrad, and I had a summer job, and I was uh, working at the Cornell Botanic Gardens, and I was in the nursery. And they were 
you know, they were growing native plants in the nursery and uh, I was tasked with weeding. And I, I was told what to weed for and I started to weed. And um, it's a good thing my mentor knew that I was pretty green and had her eyes on me because I started to weed uh, the plants rather than the weeds. So I had a lot to learn um, when it comes to native plants. And, you know, she quickly set me correct. And, you know, as an undergrad student in landscape architecture, we learned a lot about some of the showier non-native species uh, and not so much about the natives at that point in time. Um, after that, I, you know, I learned a lot that summer and I had the opportunity to work for a firm where I was able to learn more about native plants and then went back to grad school specifically to learn about uh, ecology and native plants some more. So that is sort of, um, I just wanted to share that embarrassing story. Uh, if you are somebody who may be weeding um, native plants on accident, there's hope for you. Um, and you can learn uh, as you go, as I have done um, as well. So with that, we're gonna kind of jump in. I'm just gonna move my window out of the way here. So the first question is, what is a native plant? And it basically, it means that it has originated in that region, um, pre-European uh, contact. It's also sometimes referred to as an indigenous species. Sometimes I use these interchangeably, so uh, bear with me um, if I do that, but I'll try to say native today just for the sake of consistency. Uh, and so then on the opposite side, right, we would have exotic or non-native or non-indigenous species, which are species that are beyond their, you know, their natural range. Uh, and as with everything, I like to ask my students to kind of, um, and I ask you all to think about what some, some of the problems are with kind of setting up this sort of dichotomy. Uh, so for example, with Catalpa, um, they're, they're not sure what the original range is. Um, so sometimes it's hard to uh, definitively say whether something is um, native or not. And then you also have the question of what you're setting as your range, right? So um, I have two pictures of erythronium on the bottom and one is our uh, Eastern trout lily. And then on the right, I have a picture. I think we were hiking in Mount Rainier there um, in the Mount Rainier area. And so we have a Western variety, right? A rest Western, um, Western erythronium. And so, you know, are you looking at native to the United States? Are you looking at native to the East Coast? Are you looking to native to New York? I've worked on projects that had to be native to the Cayuga Lake Basin. So there's all these levels of specificity, right? How specific do you want to go? Um, with your with your design for your home and what what are you setting as your native zone <laughs> that you're working from? Um, so that's another question to kind of think about at the start. So you know the next thing is why why does this matter? Why do we you know want to use native plants? And there are a number of reasons. Uh, there's a lot of research, and I'm not oh I'm not going to um, go over too many statistics, but I'll share a couple on the next slide. Uh, but some of the basic concepts for why I like to use native plants are, they are beautiful. There are uh, plants that are quite showy and quite wonderful and that have a lot of variety over the seasons. Um, they bring great wildlife value and I'll share some research uh, briefly on that point as we go and I'll try to point out some of those values as we go. Uh, you can really enhance diversity and kind of help protect diversity through using native plants. And one of my biggest points is a sense of place. Um, when I go hiking in the Catskills and um, you know around Delhi, I don't want it to feel the same as when I go hiking in Connecticut or you know and en enter in some other place, right? So I think it's I think it's important for the sense of place as well. Uh, and over time, um, especially once the species are you know the plants are established, uh, there's a tendency to need less maintenance than some of the um, non-native species. So, you know, the concern is not necessarily with all non-native or non-indigenous species, it's with those that are invasive um, that we need to really be mindful of. And the issue is that sometimes we don't know if something's going to be invasive uh, 
right out of the gates. And so if we can plant native species and avoid non-indigenous um, species, we can avoid hopefully planting invasives um, along the way. Uh, they do, there's been research that suggests, you know, the non-invasive or non-indigenous invasives do create a lot of economic damage. That's the first bullet up there. Uh, they do threaten um, non-native species um, or non-native species that are invasive threaten endangered species. Uh, they often outcompete them. And then um, often we find that those that have been planted um, often can be escaping from our planting zones and cause problems um, in the native uh, ecosystems. So this picture on the bottom, right, it's a little hard to see, but I was driving around um, somewhere between Ithaca and Dryden area and a car was pull pulled over and I just kind of pulled over and rolled on my window, are you okay? And they were taking a picture of this uh, scene you see here and they just loved this purple plant and they wanted to know where they could get it. And I said, yeah, that's better for just your pictures. That's purple loose strife. And this one um, is, it, it likely came over in ship ballast as well as probably was planted uh, for its showy qualities. And now uh, of course is, a, you know, a invasive species of concern in some, some areas. So um, they can be pretty, but they can be, uh, problematic. So if we avoid them, we can hopefully uh, do our part in trying to prevent um, the spread of invasives. And there's uh, more recently a lot of research on uh, how using natives versus non-natives impacts wildlife um, and birds. So Doug Tallamy has written a lot about this, and I know some of you are familiar with his work. Um, this is a study uh, that was done um, by some researchers in the Washington DC suburbs, and they found that birds were looking more for food on natives. Uh, and that the non-natives did not have as many caterpillars on them, um, which then impacted the likely sighting of breeding birds in those non-native species and um, nests and yards that had fewer native species had fewer eggs in them. Um, and this was looking at Carolina chickadees, but there have been other studies uh, you know, relative to this as well that also suggests uh, if we are using native species, we may be you know, providing better habitat for, um, for our wildlife and our bird um, friends. So. so what we can do, right, as homeowners, and this is a la Tallamy, right, is to plant natives in our yard. And um, this is what we set out to do when we moved to our very small postage <laughs> stamp size property in Delhi. Uh, we had mostly grass and also, you know, some um, like foundation plantings around the house. And we slowly have been planting more and more and um, more natives as we go. Uh, and uh, we've had a lot of fun doing that. And we've seen a, a, a number of different species and wildlife coming to our yard um, as a result of the increased planting of natives. Um, and we could try to reach up to 94% native vegetation in our yards, um, that would be great. Uh, I'm not quite there yet. I still have probably too much lawn to reach that proportion, but uh, I'm working on it. I can keep planting a little bit each year um, and you know, see the, the, the fruits of that um, over time. So this little garden here, my children wanted a rainbow garden. And so we were using mostly natives. There's a couple not natives in there, but mostly natives and trying to create a rainbow as you wrap around the garden. So you got the reds, the orange, the yellows, and then it kind of, you can't quite see it, but it wraps around and um, has some blues and purples on the uh, opposite side. Uh, and we've had just so many visitors and what, you know, such great array of wildlife in our, you know, village property, I think um, largely due to, to these plantings that we've added. Um, probably one of our most interesting visitors were the kingbirds that were coming to the Amelink here. And I looked out in the morning, I always get my coffee and I look out the window and I was looking out the window and as I was looking out the window, somebody was looking back at me with binoculars and I thought, oh boy, what's going on? So I, you know, I, the screen door, I opened the screen door a little bit and I asked and he was, he was watching the birds in the, the shrub there, but that was a pretty interesting um, moment where I was looking out and he was looking at me and we were both kind of 
seeing the birds in the in the shrubs there. So um, I'm not going to go through this whole list, but even in the village um, on a very, very small site, and this is not inclusive, uh, we have a lot of uh, visitors. So um, hopefully that convinces you that this might be a, a good idea to um, try to use some more native plants on your site. Um, and some of the steps to take with that are um, first and foremost, something really important is to think about your site and what you have. Uh, and this takes a little bit of time. We get eager. We just want to buy the plants and plant them. Um, but we need to find the right plant for the right, you know, for the site that you have. So take some time to survey your property. Um, you would want to kind of try to figure out what kind of soils you have, um, look at the depth of the soils and study the sun um, and shade patterns. How moist are your soils? Are they wet? Are they dry? Look at the topography um, and think about how much space you have and think about the plant, you know, three to five years from now, uh, rather than how it looks when you first get it and try to plan for, for that as well. Um, another thing that I'm fond of and I advise homeowners to do is to take a walk around a natural area that reminds you of your site, um, especially a natural area close by to your house, and think about and look at what plants are doing well in those situations and then, um, you know, try to model your, your landscape based upon those observations that you make. Um, so most of you, if you know, I, I saw a couple of your pictures of some of you have a sunny kind of condition you're working with. Some of you have shade or semi-shade. Um, most of you probably have acidic to slightly acidic soils in this region. Um, most of us are in around a 5A zone. Um, think about how much space you have. I already mentioned that. And then really start to think about how much uh, oops, sun or shade um, you're getting and then the moisture gradient for your location and maybe map it out because if you're thinking about one one garden space um, part of it might get more sun than the other side right so think about the whole bed um, the whole area you want to plant and start to map out the the light patterns um, on the site as well and then you can start to choose plants that make sense for that site um, based upon those conditions. And then again, I often think about composition and wildlife, and I'll talk about that briefly on an upcoming slide, color and season, um, taste and use. And then there's a whole bunch of other special uses you could also design for, um, such as, you know, for example, rain gardens are fairly popular um, now as uh, something that you could choose species for, um, particularly for those conditions that are more moist. So, you know, in choosing, you know, plants for the kind of light conditions and moisture conditions you have, um, there are a lot of search engines now and sites that allow you to search based upon the conditions in your zip code. They didn't used to have all those. Um, and, and you know, you know, you can find this stuff in tables and books too. Um, but these websites are really useful. And so you don't don't feel like you have to scroll all this down right now. I'll share some of these websites at the end where you can again put in your area code and kind of the conditions that you're you're looking at, and it will give you some of the species that would work well. Um, that, that are native uh, if for those conditions. So you can find plants that flower in the shade and you can find um, obviously flowering species for sunny locations as well. And then the same thing with, uh, these are more herbaceous species and some of them with the asterisk can take some wetness, um, some moist soils, uh, and some of them can take, you know, drier soils as well. So you can look at all kinds of gradients and find the plants that would match uh, your particular needs. Um, this just, again, this is looking at woody species from moist to dry. And sometimes there's ones that like Nerica can tolerate a little bit of um, moisture as well. Um, but you can find uh, woody species that will um, meet the needs that you have. So some of the things I think about um, as I'm trying to pick species from those lists is a uh, composition. And when I think about composition and design um, using plants, I think about it both vertically and horizontally. And I, on the next slide, I'll show you the horizontal uh, picture. But for vertical, when I'm designing, I try to create 
Um, if there's enough space, that sense a canopy, or if you can't have tall trees um, because of the location, you might have a taller shrub or a mid-size uh, tree. Uh, the shrub layer and then the understory and, and ground layer. And if we can have these layers, again, we're kind of increasing the diversity of habitat. And um, if we design for those, we hopefully will also enhance uh, for wildlife. In terms of horizontal structure, there's uh, been a lot of research. This is an old uh, diagram that I particularly like. You can tell it's pretty old because it looks like it's like a Xerox copy. Um, I'm sure there's probably a showier picture like this, but um, what I like about this is it shows that horizontal structure and how certain wildlife um, species need particular kinds of habitat. So for example, we often hear like edge conditions yield the most diversity, and that's great. Um, however, if you really want to create a habitat for flying squirrels, um, you may want more mature forests, right? So certain species do need interior, whether it's interior forest or interior uh, field. Um, so, you know, the edge is, is kind of a great area because you can see that some of these species kind of overlap that edge condition, but there are some things that need that um, deep forest and also, you know, field. So um, you can find charts like this and that can help you in your goals as well. And then color and seasonal peel uh, <laughs> in Delhi, you all know in this area, we have a long winter and a long time of cold. and uh, I love the spring. I love when things are coming up in the garden now. The Virginia bluebells are just starting to come out. Um, the erythronium's kind of coming up now and um, the bloodroot is coming up um, for the spring. And then the summer, uh, we have a lot of um, additional species flowering in the late summer. And then of course the fall and thinking about fall color in the garden. And then the winter, which seems like it goes on forever. So again, thinking about the structure is important in the winter and how um, the branches and um, the branches may catch the snow or how the evergreens um, create uh, some year round color or how the branches, maybe the twigs or the bark um, are appealing in the winter. So those are some other things I kind of think about as a designer um, and especially in, in this region. Taste and use, um, this is one that we sometimes don't think maybe about, um, but there are many tasty natives. And I mean, sometimes we, we don't think about it. We just go around eating them, you know? Um, so this is my daughter when she was much younger, just really spending hours picking blueberries at Cranberry Lake. Um, now they're, they're getting older and they, they know right where to go at Cranberry Lake, where they can get winter, uh, wintergreen. Um, they really love to chew on that. Uh, and there are particular places where they know where to go to get the things that they're looking for. Um, I think when they were, you know, early teens, they often would tease me like, why do I need to know where to get plants to eat? Um, but I think, <laughs> I think they've uh, uh, grown to maybe love and hate that they know where to go to pick different species and to use different native plants um, as well. So there are many to think about. I was trying to see what other ones I had on my list um, to talk about. Oh, blueberries, wintergreen, um, and then just really all the senses, like how can plants, how can we engage plants with all of our senses? So if you think about like quaking aspen and the noise and the rustling of the leaves um, or, you know, birches and how the texture, the tactile qualities of the bark appeals to our sense of touch. So just thinking about all of our senses as well and how we use them when we um, design. So uh, many of you here on the call are probably interested in wildlife um, and insects. Uh, and I had a, a one message asking about deer. So I, I do want to kind of touch on that a little bit. Uh, and I'll try to highlight that as I go uh, for some more deer resistant uh, plant choices. But um, wildlife and insects, you know, we, we need to provide water. We need to think about shelter and then food sources. And again, a variety um, of food sources throughout the year. Uh, deer are definitely <laughs> part of our uh, 
part of our environment. And I, I think, you know, they, they like to check out new things too. Like, I feel like new plantings seem like, uh, they're, they might be scared, but they're a little bit curious. And so they might be more susceptible than things that have been around for a while. In general, um, things that have kind of uh, unusual textures, uh, maybe hairier um, and odors are, are a little more deer proof um, or deer resistant, uh, but deer eat a lot of things. Um, so even some of these things I'm gonna say are resistant um, as we go, you may find that they might get munched once in a while. Um, so I'll try to highlight that as I go. And again, there's been a lot of um, recent research on, again, native species and their benefits for birds, especially um, there was this, I just was at a presentation where they shared this research and I wanted to share it with all of you about uh, basically how different um, berries are beneficial to migratory songbirds. And they were able to rank them in um, order of kind of highly recommended. And then you can see how it goes down recommended and eaten um, by many and then eaten by few um, and so forth. And also they looked at the antioxidant properties. Um, so some of these, I think we'll be looking at red osier dogwood um, in an upcoming slide and service berry, um, but there's some others that you can check out on this list as well. So with that, we're gonna to start to look at a couple of favorites and then we'll spend some time um, talking about implementation a little bit after we go through some of these favorites and then I'll try to get to some of your questions. So um, the first set up here are spring wildflowers, spring ephemerals. And I just keep moving my uh, zoom out of the way here, so bear with me. Um, so we have on the left, um, Erythronium americanum, and then uh, we have the Virginia bluebell, Mertensia uh, virginica on the right. Um, and then we have uh, on the left here, Bloodroot, and then Trillium, and there are a number of different Trillium. Um, I really love these spring ephemerals because I love the spring. And so um, these come up often before other things are up, often before the forest um, leaf out. And so they have this moment where they can get the sun. Um, and then, you know, often they senesce when, when the upper um, canopy kind of closes up. Um, so they're really beautiful. This, uh, the Bluebells are extremely beautiful um, and they have kind of blues and pinks. And I often plant them with ferns. So once they start to die back, the ferns are kind of kicking in at that point. Um, the bloodroot is just, I love how the leaves clasp the flower. Um, it's really, really beautiful. And trillium, sometimes you can find whole stands of um, trillium in a particular area. Um, as well. So these are some of my early favorites that tell me that spring is here and they're really important for insects too. Like our, our mason bees are just coming out and, you know, some of these early flowering um, plants are really important for those insects. Um, in terms of perennials, uh, I really love the jack in the pulpit uh, here. I love it because it's just got such a cool structure to it. Uh, it has kind of these maroon hues um, around the space here. And then you can see the uh, kind of three leaves uh, per, per stem here. And it's just got a really unique character to it um, that gives it a lot of um, interest. So we've got the jack in the pulpit here and then there's some blood root around the base. Um, again, thinking about those different layers vertically. Um, then I have on here the milkweeds and what's neat about milkweeds is, you know, there's so many different uh, types that you can find one for your, your particular needs. Some like it a little bit wetter, like Incarnita can take a little bit more moisture um, and then others can take a, a little bit, you know, drier conditions. Of course, we know, you know, the importance of the milkweed for the monarchs. You have a chrysalis on the top left here on one in our, our yard. Um, and so milkweeds are a great, a great choice. Um, and so I is for insects and H is for hummingbirds. I'm going to try to um, point that out as I go. And I should have mentioned that both the um, bloodroot and the jack in the pulpit is more or less deer resistant. Again, I'm going to put that in quotes because sometimes they eat things that maybe you'd think that they um, 
don't usually. So uh, Monarda didima, um, maybe any of the Monardas really uh, are a great species to consider. Um, they're a bit taller, um, they like the sun. And um, this particular one, uh, the hummingbirds, it's a hummingbird magnet. And what I really love to watch is that the hummingbirds uh, fly around and go from one tube to the next tube to the next tube and the next tube and they just kind of make their circle around it and it's really fun to watch. Um, so this is a really nice choice. Um, it has a nice fragrance to it. Um, the leaves are, of some of them are I think used for tea. I have not done that um, but my children sometimes suck on uh, one of the flower petals. They're kind of sweet at the base um, and this too you know it's fragrant and so it tends to be deer resistant um, species. Uh, the turtle heads are also somewhat deer resistant and they can take a bit of shade. Uh, they have a really bold structure and texture that I like uh, and their flowers are quite fun. You can kind of pinch them like snapdragons and the bumblebees love these in um, when they're flowering, the whole plant is humming in our yard and you, you just walk by it and you just hear this mm, and it's um, all coming from uh, from the plant. It's a great, a great plant to use. It's uh, quite a bit taller than, you know, some of the, you can see violets down here. Um, so this one gets to be a little bit taller. Um, not super tall. This guy would be super tall. Um, so the Eupatoriums, uh, Joe pie weeds, again, somewhat deer resistant. They can be quite tall, like four feet ish more, maybe. Uh, I use this to hide our compost bin. Um, they have nice flowers and also the purple color um, kind of follows into the leaves as well. Again, kind of a bold texture, um, nice uh, coarse texture and can tolerate some moisture as well. Uh, and then I paired these two together. I sometimes plant them together. So we've got echinacea um, on the left uh, and great for birds um, and hummingbirds and insects. And then Rebecca on the right. And there's a picture, I don't know if you can quite see it, but there's a hummingbird moth there, which just to me is like this Dr. Seuss type character. It's got like the hummingbird mouth parts or head and then like the wings of a moth. And then the tail looks like a crayfish to me. It's a really neat uh, insect um, to have visiting uh, visiting your yard. Um, and these these are nice together. They, they pair nicely together. Um, the coneflower is supposed to be deer resistant, but I think we have some hungry rabbits uh, in our yard or something, something eats these. I'm not sure um, exactly. I haven't caught the uh, wildlife, but I guess I'm sharing and that's okay um, to share. So then I have um, Paris Saladego Ragoso, the Ragosa um, on the left, um, the goldenrod, and then uh, the New England aster on the right and the purple flower here. Um, these, you know, you talk about complementary colors, you got the yellow and the purple, uh, and that's really neat to see paired together and is a fun combination for a little bit later in the summer. Um, and again, these can both take sun just as the prior slide um, can take sun as well. They can take a little bit of shade, but for the most part, uh, some of them, some of the golden rods and some of the asters can take more shade. Um, but. And then, you know, in addition to herbaceous plants, we can also think of vines and ground covers as a category. So um, some people get annoyed maybe with Virginia uh, creeper here with the Parthenocissus, but it has a stunning red fall color. Um, it is used by mammals quite a bit. Um, the mammals and birds um, eat this plant. And so it is an important species to think about. It can be used as a ground cover or it can climb. Um, you may have to pull some of it out, you know, if, if it gets beyond its bounds. Um, I, I like the ginger down here on the left, Acerum canadensis, uh, it, a uh, canadensis, sorry, it's a low ground cover. It tolerates deep shade. The flowers are cool, not very conspicuous, or they're kind of not that showy. They're um, kind of maroonish brown and they hang low to the ground, but it makes a very nice uh, ground cover. And then also we have Tiarella, um, which makes a beautiful ground cover as well. Can take some part shade. 
And then we have a little bit of mayapple on the left there too. Ferns, uh, my husband studies ferns, so we tend to have a lot of ferns in our yard uh, as well. So there's maidenhair fern, Christmas fern, which is evergreen. Uh, and then we have cinnamon fern um, on the right. And there are many other kinds of ferns. And um, some of them, like these two are a little more deer resistant, but my husband says, yes, the deer eat them, eat, eat ferns too. So we have some hungry deer, um, but they maybe won't be as munched as some other plants. <laughs> um, and then just briefly gonna look at a couple shrubs and trees that I really like, and then um, get into some implementation tips. So my favorite by far, if I could only pick one, um, one tallish shrub, maybe you call it a small tree, maybe you call it a tall shrub. I would go with an amelanchier, here, a multi a clump form amelanch here. Um, the service berry, uh, it's very great for birds. The birds uh, really like the fruit um, and they, you know, do all kinds of acrobatics as they're eating that. Uh, the fall color is really beautiful. Um, some of them can be almost just like a peach color in the fall. This one has a little bit more red on it, uh, reds to yellows. Um, nice spring flowers um, and they tend to flower. Um, it's often called shad blow. So I think the flowers are to occur roughly when I guess the shad is a type of fish. Um, I'm not sure what the shad does at the time when the flowers come out, but it's somehow associated with shad um, in this area. It's a really wonderful choice. And um, the, the berries, when they turn dark, purple, um, purplish red, can be used for human consumption as well. We make muffins with these and they're quite tasty. Um, on the left, we have redbud and um, redbud is a kind of flowers out early as you can see on the left. And then when the flowers drop, um, this was a picture taken at Cornell, when the flowers drop, the whole ground is just a sea of pinkish purple um, petals. And it's a beautiful uh, for the flowers, the heart shaped leaves are really neat. And then the branching, it has really graceful um, sorts of branching. So it's a lower, um, a lower tree. And then witch hazel is also a neat uh, plant to consider. Can, it's fragrant and um, flowers in, uh, in unusual times. You can have spring flowering um, forms as well as fall flowering. So um, the one that we planted when it first flowered, it flowered on my mother's birthday in November. Um, and so you can have some late, late flowers in your um, garden. Uh, Cornus um, we we talked about that that was deer resistant, the red twig dogwood um, can get, there's some shorter forms and some taller forms. You can see the twigs, I hope you can see are red. Uh, and so in the winter time, um, this makes a nice contrast with the snow. You can also find some forms that have yellow um, branching. And again, some that are short and some that can get uh, over your head in size um, quite easily. The more you prune it, you can kind of maintain that red um, branching characteristic. It has white flowers and um, fruit as well. Ilex glabra um, is a nice evergreen to consider. It's a little bit weak wooded, so I wouldn't put it at where you're gonna dump large snow piles, uh, but it has a nice fine texture um, for our Ilexes and it, it's got nice glossy, um, a glossy leaves and is a good evergreen choice. And Ilex verticillata um, has these red berries that persist um, after the leaves drop. And I've heard and re I read or I heard at some point that eventually birds do eat them, but the birds like them to freeze and thaw a couple of times. It makes the berries more palatable um, for them. So um, you, you can see them in the winter landscape um, with the red berries and they can take some moisture. So sometimes you see them in areas that are a little bit more moist and in the winter, they can really catch your, your eyes um, and are quite beautiful. Uh, Rus aromatica, I, I like this plant a lot. It's um, a nice ground cover and so it stays lower and kind of creeps across the ground. It starts off a little slow, but then it seems to pick up and spread pretty well. Has a nice uh, red fall color and is um, a good for birds as well. 
blueberries. We can't, you know, I can't say enough good things about blueberries. So there's high, high and low uh, types of blueberries. And um, again, edible, um, nice fall color, uh, you know, instead of planting um, Euonymus alata, uh, I would, you know, strongly encourage people to think about blueberries if their soils are acidic enough to do so. Um, so they're really a good choice. And then just a couple of trees. Um, I know a lot of people may or may not have space on their property for trees, but I certainly like um, the red maple um, top left and um, um, Bachelor Niagara with a peeling bark is very appealing. The river birch um, on the right here. Then we have Nissa salvatica um, down here. Uh, it has a yellow fall color and the branches sort of spiral out around the trunk. Um, so it's an interesting um, branching characteristics. And then all sorts of oaks and oaks um, have been studied and written about a lot by Telemi about how how many um, species of insects they support and how those insects are then very important for birds um, in terms of caterpillars and um, things that the birds need. Um, so, so with that, I could go on with more plants, but I wanna make sure we have time for, um, time for questions. So I just have a couple slides on implementation tips. So you got a lot to think about, some design ideas, um, thinking about your site and what you have on the conditions um, on your site and around your site, and then starting to choose plants that are going to um, do what you would like them to do for your property. Uh, I highly encourage everybody to start small, um, you know, test a couple of things first and see how they do. I know that's really hard because we want to kind of get a bunch of things in plan them and get done. But I think sometimes it is wise to see what, you know, test a couple um, and before you get five of them and see how they do um, on your property. Uh, and I encourage phasing as well. So thinking about maybe you put in the taller plants first, and then maybe the next year you come in and you do um, sort of the understory species. So thinking about how you can phase your project um, to keep it manageable as well. Um, and a, a friend um, said, you know, they sleep, they creep, and they leap. So the first year the plants are going to sleep, the second year they creep, and the third year they leap. Um, so having patience is also um, something to think about and to think about that leap phase so that when you're planting things, you're not planting them too tight together. Um, however, I do plant things maybe more tight than some would think because um, the tighter you plant and the more densely you plant, the less chance you'll have that you're gonna have other things establishing in the bed. So um, there's kind of a happy medium where you're not putting things on top of each other, but you're keeping weeds down and problems as well. Um, in general, it's a good idea to plant in masses um, and people kind of suggest a triangular formation. So you're looking down at this drawing from like up above as if it's a plan view. Um, so you'd wanna kind of plant in sort of a triangular way and then sometimes have a gap and then another. Um, they used to always say plant in odd numbers. I don't know um, the exact science to that, um, but you can try that or, or you could disregard. Um, but I do tend to plant more, more so in um, odd numbers and some repetition. And with this, we have to be careful because we wanna have um, repetition visually in the landscape because sometimes it looks wonky if you have like too many different things going on. However, diversity we know is important. And so um, repetition with diversity, I guess, would be the new way I would think about um, suggesting the implementation of um, your planting plan. Um, finding good sources is super important and it's sometimes missed. It's so easy to order something online and not really question where did it come from or how was it grown? Um, so again, you know, you need to think about what, what, you're, what are you setting as your native range, um, so native to where. Uh, research, kind of contemporary research suggests that sometimes funny or showier looking varieties and colors might look cool or like double flowered um, types of plants might be neat and you might think, oh, it's so beautiful because it's a double flower but sometimes they're less valuable to, um, to the insects. It's harder for them to reach the nectar or what they need in the, the plant. So, um, you know, maybe truer to form is actually better for wildlife. 
Wildflower, um, I just put that, I, I used it on an earlier slide. We say wildflower sometimes, but be careful. Like if you get a thing that says wildflower seeds, that doesn't mean native. So you can have a field of non-native wildflowers. <laughs> so um, wildflowers is kind of a catch-all term. It doesn't necessarily mean native. So just be careful with that. Um, I really ask you all to um, not do field collecting. Um, you know, if you're moving something showy from one place to another, um, it may not survive and it can be damaging that habitat where you're taking it from. So it's much better to buy them from reputable sources, preferably where um, the gardener, the garden center is, you know, doing seed grown and using local sources and things of that nature. So I just put in some um, beautiful examples of orchids on the bottom. And, you know, many of the orchids have specific um, mycorrhizal fungi that they need. And so if you like took this thing and yanked it out because it was so beautiful and you put it in your garden, um, it may not, it's highly likely it won't succeed, right? So um, we just want to try to avoid that. So I said I would mention some databases. So there's all kinds of great databases. I have the Audubon one up top and you can put in your zip code and then you can also search for plants that meet particular like types of birds that you want to attract to your garden. So you can search in that fashion um, using that database. And then there are a couple others up here, Native Plant Trust, Plant Finder, um, NWF Plant Finder. So there's lots of different plant finders. Then there's private companies that have um, you know, finders as well. And I'm not advocating for any particular kind of um, private company, but I just put that up there as an example that you can find them. And you can also filter by moisture gradient that you have on your site, and that can help you narrow down the plants that you should pick for your location. There's also deer resistant lists. So if you do a Google search, um, Cornell um, Cooperative Extension and other sources have some deer resistant options for you there too. So, um, and then, you know, again, I mentioned that you would have perhaps less maintenance if you use native plants, uh, and especially if you're picking the right plant for the right site, um, that's the goal. And the last thing to think about here um, for maintenance is uh, we all kind of want to tidy up, um, you know, when fall comes. However, if we can handle a little bit of untidiness and leave some of the seeds on our, our plants that have gone to seed, um, that's beneficial for the birds. Um, so I tend to do more of an early spring cleanup rather than a fall cleanup. Um, and again, it's just if you can tolerate that slightly messy maybe look for a little bit. Um, I think it will benefit our, our wildlife. So a plug for that. Um, and then there's wonderful zillions of great references. So I have some up here, number of slides. There's great nurseries in our area that you can go to and they're so knowledgeable and can help you as well with the needs that you, you may have for your location um, and a bunch of other sources. So um, that's all I have. What's on that slide? Okay, more, more sources. So, um, and I have just, you know, my, my email in case you have any questions, you can feel free to, to email me, but I'd be happy to answer some now. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. thank you. Um, the, uh, here's someone with a, I'm sure a question you hear all the time. I have issue with bishop sweet on my property. It has taken over everywhere and I feel powerless to eliminate it. Do you have any words of wisdom for how to get rid of bishop sweet? Thank you. Yeah, this is such a tough question. Um, and it's a great question. And I, my mom always wants to give us plants, but they have it in their yard. And I'm like, no, don't get, don't give me it. Um, and she has given me some, but I put it in pot pots first and I grow it there before I put it in the garden because I so don't want that in our garden. Um, I don't have a good answer for mm. you on that. Um, I have done a lot of just pulling it out, repeated pulling it out. You could try to cover it um, for a while um, and then and then plant, um, you know, dig it up maybe and then plant. Um, even when you do that, if there's pieces of the roots, it, it could, you know, come back again. So I think, unfortunately, it's going to be um, 
I, I, maybe there's somebody that knows the answer to that, but I don't know. I don't have a good answer for you on that. Sorry. Hi, Lisa. Here's another question from one of our listeners. She says, we took down some old outbuildings last year and want to cover the ground. While cleaning up the debris, we found an infestation of Asian worms. Do you know of any native plants that can survive damage from these worms? No. Um, so I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago and they were talking about this as well. Um, I would probably reach out to Cornell Cooperative Extension or maybe CRISP as well. I don't know if CRISP um, works more with plants or if they also are looking at things like the worms um, and maybe they would have some good guidance for you. Um, I would suspect that we'll find that there are some species that can tolerate um, them, but what those are right now, I don't have the answers for. Mm. Lots of great questions that I don't have answers for, but maybe we'll have answers in you know a year or, or so on those questions. And this is regarding shad bush. Um, shad bush got its name because it blooms around the same time shad returned to their spawning grounds in the Chesapeake Bay's freshwater rivers and streams. Lovely. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. Um, I, I, my, my grandfather was a huge fisher, a fisherman, and I, I knew it connected to shad, but I wasn't able to articulate that. So I really appreciate learning more about that. Thank you. <laughs> Another of our listeners says, I have an issue with spiderwort taking over and choking out other perennials. What can I do? Yeah, so I think with a lot of these, I just result to manual pulling and digging and then heavily planting. Um, so I would pull out as much as I could. I would dig out as much as I could, put in some fresh soil and then replant and mulch. Um, and, or if you can, it, depending on the location, if you can keep it covered for a while too, um, that's always a good option, but sometimes we don't want to look at black plastic or, you know, covering for, um, a year or so or more, right? So it depends on the location. Here's a comment about Bishop's weed. The answer for Bishop's weed is to plant things that will grow higher than it will. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, out shade it, out compete it. Um, those are good, good choices. Someone else asks, what things will grow well under pine trees? Yep, so they're more acidic. Um, so under pine trees, um, you know, in natural systems, there are often not a lot of plants right under the trees because of the density of the needles and the shade. Um, but slightly out for them. Sometimes I see partridge berry. Um, sometimes I start to see violets in the outskirts. Um, so I think right under them, it will be tricky um, to think about. You'd have to plant things that can tolerate the shade and the acidity. Um, but uh, further out from the trunk, you would be able to enjoy more variety of plants in that zone. Um, a question. Uh, many of us seem, many of us seem to tend to buy perennials at local nurseries. As far as finding natives, if we check genus and species names, are we okay or have many natives been hybridized? Can you recommend a local nursery? Yes. Um, so I, I, I do think um, it's okay to buy some from some of those uh, retailers. And um, I think anything we're doing in the realm of planting natives, as long as they haven't, as long as they've been grown in a, a sustainable and an ethical way, I think is, is, is fine. Um, in terms of some local nurseries, um, I know the fernery is Coast, you know, is working with Audubon for the plant sale. Um, so that's a great choice. And Connie, I think, is on the call tonight and is very knowledgeable. Um, Catskill Native Nursery is fairly nearby as well. 
Um, and then um, I know the, the person at the Plantsman Nursery is a little bit more towards the Ithaca area, um, and that's another kind of good option. So those are three that I've had experience with. Um, and I mean, there are others, I'm sure, too. And again, I don't want to steer you away from other choices, but those are three that I can say I have um, knowledge of and have had uh, good experiences with. Yeah. One listener asks, does solarization work? Is it plant dependent? So and perhaps you could explain what it is. So I am not sure. I'm looking in the, ch is it in the Q and A? In the it's chat. In the chat. In solarization. The solarization. So I'm not sure. I'm wondering if it means killing the plants with sun or using sunlight to your benefit? I'm not sure. Um, David, I, I don't know if you could elaborate on that. David, you're muted, but you're welcome to unmute your microphone and explain your question a little bit. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's just the use of uh, plastic sheeting. Sometimes it's opaque, sometimes it's translucent, sometimes it's fairly clear. Um, I know it was something years ago that people were were using on various invasive species, but I'm, I'm not sure I know if it's, um, if it works. Yeah, I think it's really gonna depend on the species. Um, and some things are just so tenacious and they just, you know, the smallest bit of root or, um, even like, for example, horsetail, one site I worked on had so much horsetail and they were trying to get rid of the horsetail and we excavated to like 18 inches and we brought in all new soil and still, um, you know, I think we even did more than 18 inches. It still was an issue. So I think it's going to depend on, um, it's going to depend on the plant. Yeah. Definitely worth a try. I mean, I try all, I would try all these things. And again, the manual um, energy, if you can, before obviously going towards like herbicides. I know I, somebody was talking to about um, for along the stream banks um, to deal with, oh my goodness, I'm blanking on, uh, can somebody help me out? The plant that's growing all along the stream banks, that's hollow. <laughs> I'm totally blanking on the name of it. Thank you, Catherine, oh, knotweed, thank you. Um, oh my goodness, it's okay. getting too late for me. Um, but yeah, the knotweed along the banks, um, somebody said if you put down hardware cloth um, on top of it and it, early in the season, like before it starts to come up and then um, if, as it keeps going through that and cutting itself, it will slowly help to kill it down. But again, if just a little piece of that root goes anywhere else, it's going to continue to grow from that root. So. Um, I've heard a lot of different options and I think um, hopefully we'll, we'll see more research in these areas in the future for controlling invasives. One person has a question. Why do so many of the plant names have the word canadensis in them? What does that mean? Yeah, I, I think um, I am not great with my Latin, but I'm guessing that it, it refers to Canada and some of the range, but I will had, I'd have to look that up. These are such great questions. I feel pretty stumped right now, but um, I would guess that that's what it ties to, but I could be, could be wrong. Um, so I know like Nova Anglia is like um, New England. So I think sometimes parts of the name um, refer to kind of their, their range uh, of origin. I have, a, I have a quick question for you. Years ago, um, I was warned about removing, obviously, you know, plants from forests and so on and trying to use them decoratively. And also was warned that there were, uh, like protections against doing that, whether it's a state law or a federal. Can you help me with that? Yes, um, I, yes, I can. So m most of the ferns are protected um, and many of the spring ephemerals that I talked about are protected. Um, and so there's actually a great book. Um, I think Raynal and Leopold probably collaborated on it together that has the New York State Protective Plants. 
<laughs> um, and there, there's some of the showier ones that people might tend to want to collect. Um, and it talks about um, how they're protected and it's kind of an educational guide for homeowners. So that's a really wonderful resource. Um, I'm not sure. I'm going to just see if I have it in this list. It might not be on this. This is one of Don Leopold's other books. I don't think I have it in here, um, but that would be a good option. And I can get that to you, Becky, the name Thank of you. that book. Yeah. Uh, another person asks, do you have any environmentally friendly suggestions to deal with Creeping Charlie? I try not to take that personally. Yeah, <laughs> the person says, I spent hours pulling it out, but feel very defeated. Yeah, so I'm not familiar with this common name. Um, does anybody know, or Cindy, do you know um, maybe another common name for it or a scientific name for it? I'm guessing it's something that climbs, kind of creeps along the ground and I'm, I'm just not sure what, what plant that is. I can look it up. I, I'm not sure. I, I usually would like look things up, but I feel like you're seeing my screen. So I don't know if I can. I just looked on Google and it's a type of ivy. A ground ivy. Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. This is one that I deal with. <laughs> I deal with a lot. Um, I, it does pull out pretty well, but again, if there's a piece of it that's left stuck in the ground, it's going to kind of continue to grow. So yes, I just pull it out a lot. I, I would, I would mulch, you know, using, I, I like cedar mulch myself, uncolored cedar mulch. I feel like cedar mulch tends to help um, reduce ticks. I feel like in our yard um, from what I can see. And so mm -hmm. I would pull out as much as I could, um, trying to get as much of the roots out as possible. Um, and then I would use a lot of mulch. Yeah. Um. With bishop's weed, if it is pulled or chopped before it flowers, will that eventually eliminate it? <laughs> uh, I would, yeah. let's see, pulled or chopped before it flowers. I would guess not because I think it spreads through its root system um, as well as possibly through its flowers. So I think that one's going to need more than, I mean, if you're pulling it, you know, and getting those roots out, then you could, I think, uh, do a dent on it, but it does take a lot of work to pull, pull it all out. Um, yeah, I don't, I think chopping it just wouldn't solve the problem because it would probably regrow. Mm -hmm. well, one of our participants suggests that Creeping Charlie responds to borax, especially in a drought. Nice, okay, that's a good idea. Um, that would be a good, good thing to try. Let's see what else we have here. We had a question that just came in through chat um, is about Phragmites and if Phragmites is considered native or non-native because that there was, and I do remember there was some controversy about that. Yeah, I have not read like the answer to the controversy, so I don't want to mislead people. Um, my inclination would have been to say no, um, but I would have to I would have to go back and see what the verdict is right now. That's a great question. I'm writing. I'm going to write down so many things to look up after, and that's why this is so exciting. Um, I really appreciate so many awesome questions that are um, leaving me stumped. When my students stump me, I say, "Okay, this is you know extra credit. Everybody go find out the answer," and they really like that. Um, so I hopefully we can all go out and um, do some more research on some of these wonderful questions. So, Lisa, do you still need screen share? Oh, no, I can take it off screen share. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we do have a couple of links that are in the chat um, and a couple of responses on Phragmites um, from Connie. Okay. Phragmites is not native. That is usually the one you usually see. There's also native 
Phragmites, uh, mm -hmm. two types of Phragmites, and there's a link to greatlakesphragmites.net um, that has information. So check the chat bubble. If you're interested, you can click right on that link. Um, I do want to um, just let everybody know a couple things. First, we have been recording the session tonight, so we will have the replay available on our website, and that will be in the webinars page. So doas.us slash webinars will give you all of our recorded webinars, and this one will be right at the top. Um, probably sometime next week, I'll have it online. Um, I also, Lisa, if you would possibly email me a text version of your resource pages, I'll add that to that page so people can click the links um, right through that page if they wanted to take a look at some of those resources that you posted. Um, so email that to me anytime, like early next week is fine, and I'll add that to that piece. Um, I also want to mention if there's anybody who's in the audience tonight who has issues with window strikes with birds hitting their windows. Um, and that is kind of the other piece if you're planting natives around your house, and you're attracting more birds and wildlife to your yard, kind of in that close proximity area, that you should take steps to make sure they're protected from window strikes. Um, we do have a couple of sample kits of uh, window strike decals that if someone has this issue and they want to try it out and let us know how it works for you, um, just to get in touch with me, info at doas.us, um, and I'll, I'll see if I can get a sample packet for you to use on a, a high concentration window where you typically would have window strikes. Um, the other thing that I will um, mention is, again, the plant sale, which um, our products are coming from the fernery, so they're hyper local um, to our region, both Delaware and Otsego County. Um, we developed that um, very specifically so that they were region specific types of plants that were available there. Um, so pop over and pick up some, some plants and hopefully we'll see you in May for the pickup. Um, and then I also want to do the announcement for our raffle winners. <laughs> so I'm going to very briefly share my screen. Um, first, having sold out, just um, we're elated. Um, thank you everybody who bought tickets. Thank you for um, Wild Birds Unlimited out in Johnson City, who you know basically helped to provide our prizes. And certainly again, to our committee who have put everything together and helped get everything out there and continue to push. Um, we really are appreciative. And the uh, proceeds from that are going to uh, go towards uh, improvements at the DOAS sanctuary up on Franklin Mountain. So the sanctuary and the Hawk Watch, um, keep an eye up there because over the next couple of years, I think you're going to see some really wonderful changes. Um, so without any further ado, I am going to share my screen with the sound and play. <laughs> So it's kind of hokey, but our first prize winner is Cindy Staley. Second prize, Rick Bunting. Third prize, Janice D'Angelo. And fourth prize, Donna and Jim Vogler. So um, thank you very, very much for that. Um, your participation is like just very, we're very grateful um, to everybody. And our fundraising committee will be in touch with each of the winners. The way it will work is, basically uh, first prize gets right of first pick and then it will go sequentially from there. Second prize will get a pick of what's left, third prize, et cetera. Um, I do have an, one other question. Um, Cindy wants to order some plants, can't make it to the pickup date. Get in touch with me because there's a possibility we can find somebody to send your plants home with. Um, on your behalf that can pass them off to you the next day. So maybe somebody in your area. Uh, so email me um, 
info at doas uh, dot us, and I will be happy to go from there. So, anything else that anybody wants to add in closing? Um, I I want to certainly thank Lisa um, for an extremely informative presentation and and a lot of fun. So we we definitely appreciate learning so much and and looking at some of your favorites, which I, I really love how you explained why they are your favorites. And we you. have a couple more questions. Should they email um, Lisa just themselves at this point? Um, yes, Lisa left her email address um, on that last slide. So if you want, um, you can just pop it in the chat window and people can copy it from there. There you go. So it's right there. Um, Lovely. Thank you all so, for your questions. Yeah, feel free to email Lisa. We'll have the recording available next week. Feel free to share it with others. Um, we'll have the resources there as well. And we hope to see everybody at next month's program about the Breeding Bird Atlas 3 with Charlie Shine. So thank you again. Thank you all. All right. And good night, everybody. Night. Thank you.